Hi all, we're going to get going. Um, I, I want to begin, um, I'm John Hyman by the way, I'm the director of the college writing program in the Department of Literature. Um, and I want to begin by saying that while I was listening to Betsy uh, earlier at lunch today, I realized that you, I have something in common with Melania Trump, which is to say, when you hear my remarks, you're going to think I borrowed them whole from what you've already heard. Um, I, I promise you I had scribbled these notes in advance of hearing Betsy, but indeed I'm going to echo a couple of her themes from, from earlier. Um, went with a Melania Trump reference to begin. Yeah, okay. Um, uh, I've also, uh, as you can see, erred on the side of eco-insensitivity by um, putting some hard copies uh, available. Um, I'm of an age that I still think it's sometimes nice to have things right on paper, right sitting on my desk. So you'll excuse me felling a tree or two and giving those to you. Um, so grading and students. You know, every now and again you'll hear a teacher, it's not usually an experienced one, who will say that she relishes grading, that it's one of her favorite parts of the job. I take that person to be delusional or, or a liar um, because it's hard. I am more exhausted after an hour of grading than I am after an hour of teaching. And if I'm not more exhausted, I fear I haven't been attending with the right focus and even with the right generosity of spirit to the thing that's in front of me. Um, this impulse and mainly it's it's for the sake of levity, is, is captured in a couple of the pieces um, that have made the, the rounds of the internet for a few years now, the five stages of grading that are chronicled in, in what I gave you. Um, I, for me, I'm a bargainer. In the, that's the fourth, I think, of Kubler-Ross's five stages, which is to say, if I can grade two more papers, I get to go watch an inning of the Red Sox game. And then I'm all disappointed when it's a one, two, three inning and I have to go right back to grade, right? A student quoted in a study recently at Indiana State University, in language that's not theatrical, captured, I think, what the task is when it comes to grading. He said this, I like it when the teacher tells you what the problem is and there is actually a criterion. That's, it's pointed as hell, isn't it? Because think of this kid. He, he just wants the teacher to tell him, like, what's the problem? And Betsy's right. If I caw in the margin, vague or awk, well, he's not trying to be awkward on purpose. If he knew how not to be awkward or how to recognize it in his own prose, he likely wouldn't be awkward. So I'm not doing it much good. I'm like the, the, the parent teaching a, a daughter to drive who just constantly slams the imaginary brake down on the right-hand side of the car to no effect at all. Well, yes, I was. Creates tension it adds to the adversary relationship between teacher and student, okay? Um, it reminds me, this state of students, of one of my favorite novels, the 1956 Bang the Drum Slowly by Mark Harris. You, you may know it, um, uh, one of the best novels written in that sport that has um, uh, given us most of, the good base, most of the good sports literature, baseball, and in that book, Harris chronicles the New York Mammoths. We can surmise that they are the New York Yankees. And the team, when a new player comes to the team, or when a fan who hovers around them in the hotel lobbies before and after games wants to kind of get, get tight with the players, they'll invite them to play a game they call tag water. It's a card game. And this is, it's a great scene in the movie. Robert De Niro plays the new, young, lug-headed catcher, as only De Niro can. And he, well, I don't, know how to, I don't know how to play. No, no, you'll get it, you'll get it. And they hand up cards, and they say, okay, it's your turn. And he kind of freezes. Well, I, I don't know what to do. And, no, just like, play a card. And he puts a card down, and the table erupts. Says, That's, I thought you said you didn't know how to play. 
That's brilliant. That's a double honeybee on the hopscotch. It's nonsense. It's complete nonsense. He does well for a few hands. Over time, he does poorly until all of the contents of his wallets have been delivered to all the other players on the, at the table. Techwater is an acronym for the exciting game without any rules. Grading shouldn't feel like Techwater to students. This is partly why we can't talk about grading without talking about just about everything else. Assignment design, syllabus construction, um, how we express our priorities to our students. It's all connected. It's all one. So, we in college writing, and you have this in front of you, try to make our criteria clear by creating a rubric. Ours is, <laughs> admittedly, a quite texty rubric. And so we have to spend some time with our students, even walking through, what does this document say to you? What does it suggest in terms of our priorities, our uh, hierarchy of values, etc.? We might then, in addition to a lot of commenting, hand back that student paper with just parts of that rubric highlighted. It creates this visual image that, oh, okay, I kind of have a sense of why I got a B minus, because the highlighted portions are tending to hover around that B, C line, okay? It also keeps us honest and consistent. Um, it's hard to uh, uh, enforce idiosyncratic standards if you have that grading rubric sitting right next to you as you're reading the student work. I tell my colleagues all the time, put a copy of it in laminate and put it on your desk. Have it at the ready. Use the language of the rubric, both in your assignments and in your feedback. Um, it, as I say, can help us become consistent. But this is not obvious or uncomplicated. My advice can't end there because there's still so much that we want to be able to communicate to our to our, uh, our students that simply commenting on this or that paper or highlighting this or that box in the rubric would accomplish. And I have to say, our session title is probably a little bit of a fraud. We imply that you know there's going to be an easy way to do this. No, no, there's not. But I think we can work towards demystifying what this is. Think of what you say to a student when he comes to your office and says, boy, I, I'm really confused about what we were talking about in class yesterday. I, I mean, I was trying to tune in, but I got to tell you, <laughs> I was not following. Well, you wouldn't say to that student, yeah, you screwed up. You didn't pay attention. You wouldn't just do whatever is the oral version of saying, unclear. You'd talk. You'd have a conversation. You'd probably lead by asking questions. You, you'd be, how shall I put this, a human being about it. <laughs> you know, what part of, you know, where did we kind of lose you? Uh, yeah, that is a tricky part. And you talk through it. I want to blur beyond all recognition any line between that conversation and how you respond in print to your students. It should be a conversation. Betsy uh, gave us the metaphor of a coach. I think it's a useful one. The writing teacher Peter Elbow gives us the metaphor of, the, of, of an attorney. He says, until that thing gets handed in, I am your attorney defending you and helping you to make the best case you possibly can. I'm only the judge at the very end of that process when I'm contractually obligated to tell you what I think of it. But I'm going to be your attorney, your coach, your supporter. Now, you know, this grading stuff is fraught, and we can get trapped into doing it in, in certain easy ways. So I teach writing. It would be simple for me to take student papers, mark the technical and usage errors, and call it a day. I could do that like that. And I'd be right. But I wouldn't be teaching the student anything. Not at all. And if all I'm doing is looking for errors, that's all I'm going to find. 
There's a wonderful article by Joseph Williams, The Phenomenology of Student Error. And he talks about the fact that if all you're looking for is the error, it will not allow you to see, perhaps, the seeds of other more important things in the paper. Right? If, if every problem to you is a nail, all you got is a hammer. <laughs> Thoreau talked about this too. He said once, you know, the beauty and grace of an eagle is kind of lost if you shoot it out of the sky and cut it up. Fair enough, right? Grades two are fraught. Okay, imagine the moment you're handing back the first set of papers. Students are filing out, and you hear conversation in the hallway. What are they saying? What you get? What you get is the only correct answer to that question. What you get? Not. Boy, I'm really curious. I know you were interested in the closer. Did Professor Shenko really think that that last metaphor worked in your head? It's, <laughs> you're right to laugh, because that has never happened in human history. But I don't want for a second you to think, oh, see, they're not concerned with all that good feedback that Professor Shenko gave them. They are. I do um, periodically a, uh, a survey of all students in the college writing classes. These are first-year students. Anonymous survey. Do you read the comments on the paper? Do you just check the grade and then throw it away? Do you, overwhelmingly, students say, yeah, I read everything on the paper. Everything. Some of them even kind of charmingly push back against the poll question by saying, like, stupid, why wouldn't I read everything on the paper? So that's one myth that I want to put aside, that students will look at it and toss it aside after checking out the grade they received. Another myth, and now I'm going to talk about the elephant that's in the room whenever these things get talked about, student evaluations. I, for another time, we can talk about the, the function and the power of student evaluations in higher ed. They are, at best, a crude measurement, and at that, I don't know that we even can be sure what they're measuring. Okay, I've editorialized, but put that aside. One can think, and there's a surface logic, well, student evaluations, I'd better give some pretty high grades, you know? There's not a positive correlation between giving high grades and getting high student evaluations. There isn't. I always suspected that, and two years ago, we did a very big study of college writing classes. Now, these are required classes. The kids aren't taking them of their own volition. There was no positive correlation between high grades and good evals. There was, in fact, a slight correlation between low grades and good evals. So I just say that as a matter of empirical evidence. Finally, I want to end with just a couple of sort of specific pieces of advice that my colleagues and I have kind of come to over the years. Clarify your criteria in advance of every assignment. I know Rose is going to speak to that. The grading criteria should echo the goals of the assignment. You don't want a student being justified in saying, yo, you asked for this, except that then you seem to have evaluated it on this other basis. Use at least once in every paper what has been called, and I don't love this phrase, an authentic response. By that, um, uh, it comes out of um, some research that's been done on response to student writing, that if you include in every paper, let's say, one authentic response, that I'll explain in a second, the student will be more open to all of your other responses. So what's an authentic response? You take off your teacher hat, and you put on your human being hat, and you write things like, yeah, I saw Springsteen in 78. It takes five seconds to write that. If you do that once on every paper, the students are going to listen more closely to everything else you've written on the paper. You know, uh oh, you know, I, yeah, I love guacamole too. It, and yeah, I mean, you can lie. It doesn't, it's sort of, <laughs> authentic doesn't have to be true. It just has to be like human. Although I did see Springsteen in 78. I, <laughs> That's not a lie. Um, don't overwhelm the writer. Teach him a thing or two instead of 
50 things. Find something to like in the assignment and actually like it. Peter Elbow calls this the believing game. Find something to admire. Use I instead of you. I'm not sure I'm following here. That's different than you're all over the place. Hear the different tone? It says the same thing. And then finally, check with the students. Here again an echo from Betsy. After I hand back the first set of papers, and I tend to give a lot of <laughs> feedback, arguably I err on the side of too much. Um, the, the next day in class, I'll have them fill out a survey, if, sort of giving me feedback on the feedback. What was helpful to you? What, what wasn't helpful to you? Would you like a little bit more attention to sentence level things? Would you? And then <laughs> here's the key, as Betsy tells us, you have to then like, do something with the feedback. You after actually have to be willing to pivot a little bit in response to the students. And all of a sudden, it's not a class. It's like 20 individual people who all had 20 different takes. Right? So to end, I just want to show something. It's really in the nature of an admission. Um, this is from 1970. I was a uh, ninth grader. 13 years old in a public high school in Central Connecticut. And I, I kept this over the years because I think it neatly explains everything one ought not do. My teacher, now long since passed, I will say, wrote on this handsome map of the Middle East, which I'm sure my 13-year-old fingers were like trembling to stay in the line. I mean, F, poor choice of color, coloring poor. And then there's a whole bunch of X's. To this day, I don't know what the X's signify. I feel certain I did not show this to my parents. I kept it out of some vague notion that it would be a useful example someday. And today, I offer it as an example of everything we should not be doing to students. Thank you, John. And I'm going to, we didn't plan this at all, but I'm going to pivot very nicely to a positive example that drives when I engage student work. Um, as you know, I'm Rose Shinko from the School of International Service. I am the Undergraduate Program Director in SIS, and this year I've taken on the added responsibility of being active, uh, active, yeah, acting uh, <laughs> associate dean for curriculum and learning. Um, so I'm doing both of those and teaching. Uh, so my very one of my very first journal articles, I sent. I do post structural IR theory. I sent it to big big name in in my field who works in post structuralism. Rob Walker, send off this article. Everybody said, oh, this is a great article, send it to Rob. So I send it to Rob, and I get a, you know, no go, no go with this article. But I got the most beautiful rejection letter I have <laughs> ever received in my life. Rob, and to this day, when I see him, I still thank him. He wrote it in such a way that he said, Rose, the, your research is brilliant, your writing is, is aesthetic and artistic, and it's probably more a sign of my own cynicism than your work and promise as a scholar. And it was just beautiful. I have that in my desk. And when I remember me sitting and getting that email and opening that rejection letter and how crestfallen I was to realize it was a rejection. But then to read that text and the humanity and the support and the, hey, I know you're a budding scholar. This isn't quite at the critical level to be published in alternatives, but that doesn't mean you should jump out a window and end it or you should change careers. That has always driven my response when I got to the college level and how I respond to my students. I've also had a whole career 
uh, in education. I've taught everything from fourth grade to the PhD level. And I began at the fourth grade level and I worked my way up <laughs> and got my PhD uh, when I turned 40 uh, and, and worked on it then. So I have a very different career trajectory, but I think it has impacted the way I engage my students at the college level. I have a couple of things to say to you. The first thing that is so very important is the climate that you create in the classroom for creative, productive writing. Your own attitude toward writing and how you approach it. Is it this anxiety-provoking affair or is it something that you genuinely enjoy doing? Do you think about it as engaging in a conversation? and wanting to speak to and have your students speak back to you. And it is very important to create that climate throughout the semester of talking to students about writing and about how you struggle with writing yourself and the things you encounter in writing. I always tell them my failure stories because then you can say to them, I get it. I know where you are and this is where I've been. So I think it's very important to create a productive <laughs> climate. I also think it's very important to lay the foundation for writing within the curriculum that you are developing and delivering itself. You have to set up your students for success. You can't go into class thinking they can't write. They can write. They do write. <clears throat> Our job is to help shape that writing into more productive, more creative venues, into clarity of expression, but to work with what they're coming with. I also think we need to think about aligning the competencies of reading, of discussing, and writing. They are integrated. And the whole point of getting them to engage in critical conversation in class <coughs> is to set them up to write. You really have to think about the questions you're asking them. Uh, when I teach, mine is absolutely text-driven, text-dependent. I make no bones about it. And I teach them from day one in the way I model and the way I want them to respond to actually go in the text, drag out the piece that we're talking about, cite the author orally. Blah, blah, blah said this on page 12. Okay, hold it. Let's all find page 12. Let's all go to the line, read it again, and then we talk about it. So it's this constant modeling of how to use the author's idea, how to respond and interpret the author's idea, and then how students, then your follow-up questions, how you're getting them to engage those ideas in your classroom discussion. So for me, I always tell my students participation is the cherry on the Sunday because it gives you that verbal opportunity to try out ideas, to see how it sounds, and to try it out among an audience of peers and with your professor. And I always say to them, that's the freebie, and plus I give you credit for class participation. <laughs> What's not to like in this scenario? So the idea for me is constantly thinking about the interaction between critical reading, engaging in critical discussions, and then writing. The other thing is to make sure that throughout class, that you are providing opportunities within your curriculum that are embedded. Betsy talked about scaffolding. I scaffold constantly. That's the only way I know how to teach. The other metaphor I use is my teaching is, is circular. I keep coming back and picking up what we already did and keep threading it back through so that the midterm is actually a point for them to go back to the beginning and re-thread with some other new way for them to apply the material. It's not merely an essay. So what did you just do here for six weeks? It's something they have to look at, grapple with, and thread those ideas back through again. I do the, exactly the same thing with the final. Why I do that? It gives them constant repetition and practice. 
I always say to them, you know, tennis. I'm a big tennis player. I didn't go out on the court when I played tennis, hit one serve into the service box and said, nailed it, got it. I hit hundreds of buckets of balls. My father would stand at the other end of the court with a baseball mitt and catch the balls as I was trying to target where to hit them in the court. Why I say that to them is writing and reading and critical engagement, it's practice, it's continuous. You've got to keep bumping into the same material over and over and over and over again. And I design my class specifically so that it's like that. And throughout the course of the semester, I build in small little group activities that link up to the writing projects. If you look at my teaching evals, I'm pretty close to getting a seven in terms of degree of difficulty of the class. Every semester I keep hoping I'll get seven. And every <laughs> other category too, by the way. No, but, but yeah. the, the degree of yeah. difficulty issue. So um, the idea for students is to embed tiny pieces of the writing projects into group work. And I'll give you a prime example of it. I already know what essay is coming at each segment. My students are writing every, uh, in the like first year classes, they're writing every two to three weeks, something of a small piece. In the 200 level, they're writing every four to five weeks. And they know that these writing projects are coming. The writing projects demand synthesis and analysis. It demands they use everything we use. And so therefore, I'm holding them accountable for the reading, but I'm also giving them opportunities in class to work on pieces of writing. Early on in the semester, I do, let's create a thesis statement. So I gave them readings, three, I gave them two journal articles, a short couple of video clips they had to watch. And then when they come into class, I put them in small groups and I say to them, using the assigned materials, what kind of a statement would you like to make that then you could defend and discuss and analyze based upon the materials you prepared for class today? So I give them time. They come up with a thesis statement. We run it up on the board then. I take the thesis statement down. We get a group to volunteer. We write it up there. And then I turn it back to the class. What kind of questions would you ask about this thesis statement? What would you need to know? What kind of responses can you give about this? We're evaluating and taking a look at the thesis statement that the students came up with. So that's one activity that I do. And I've embedded specific writing activities in every maybe second or third class so that they're doing something that relates directly to writing. I foreshadow the writing assignments. I already know what the essays are. So I foreshadow with them getting them to think and prompting them to bring the materials together in interesting ways so that I'm already getting them to think about what their response would look like in a written kind of a product. I provide guidance along the way to them all the time. And there are a couple ways I can do this. And very quickly, I'm just going to show you two different essay assignments. Let's see, did it come up? How do I get it? To, ah, there we go. Okay, this is for a first year class. Um, and this was on a chapter from Hannah Arendt on action and the Ai Weiwei exhibit downtown at the Hirshhorn. And so you can see what I did in the question. This is first year students, right? So this is my very first essay assignment. I'm not making them ha have to figure out what to do. I'm literally saying them. How does Ai Weiwei's acts and words exemplify Arendt's conceptualization of action? So I'm giving them, these two things go together. I'm already telling you that they go together. I want you to think about how they go together and why they go together. So this particular, and I'm not, I guess I scroll down. There we go. I have a Mac. <laughs> so. What I do for them is I give them, and I'm not going to read through all of this for you, but I give them some suggested ways to approach the essay. Now remember, this is the first essay, so I'm trying to give them as much guidance as possible. And so I'm giving them, you know, here's some things you can do. 
and I tell them, you don't have to do it this way, these are just suggestions. And I show them, oops, about how to organize their ideas. And then I tell them what they should be doing. Explaining, discussing, illustrating, giving them, and then here's the most important part. What am I looking for? Clear, detailed knowledge of the reading, knowledge of the materials on Ai Weiwei, personal observation and interpretation, ability to make clear and substantive connections, clearly explain and illustrate the connections. So there I'm laying out so they know exactly what I'm looking for in the essay. If you want them to turn in good writing, you've really got to work with them to show them and model for them what good writing consists of. And this is entirely my own idiosyncratic, this is how I do it. <laughs> um, and then when I grade, I have these points sitting right beside me. And all my comments are directly related to those. I do it in track changes. Everything comes in email. And I grade them in the order in which they come in. I highlight the thesis statement. And then I will make some comments about the thesis statement. And I try to be positive. I always start with the positive first. I always do. This is a really interesting idea. However, it could use blah, blah, blah. Then in that same paragraph, in the highlighting mode, I highlight what the key pieces of the argument are, where I see key examples. This is a great example. You could have pushed this a little further. And here's how you could have pushed it further. You could have mentioned this. Always saying to them, this could do this, but showing them. It doesn't do enough to say to them, oh, the argument didn't go far enough. They have no idea what, what that means. So I try to give them that piece. This takes an inordinate amount of time. This workshop is misnamed. This is not about quick ways to doing it. This is really about how do I listen and hear my students in their writing. And I, I do it in segments. I say to myself, like John, I'm in a grade six. <laughs> And then I'm going to go do something else. And then I'm going to come back. And I tell my students, I'm honest with them, I get 35 essays in one class. This class was 19. I say to them, realistically, this is going to take me a week. And they're going to be coming back maybe four or five a day. You'll, you'll see them be coming, you know, they'll be coming back to you. But I'm honest with them. This is how long it's going to take me. And at the end, when I get to the end of it, I summarize for them. This is what was really good about your essay. This is what I really appreciated. This is what I thought was really positive. Here are the things you need to work on. I'm a big fan of split grades. And I do it deliberately because I say the grade is really more like in the B minus, but it really could be a B if you did this. And so I'm giving them, this is kind of where it is, and this is where it could go. And I also believe that if you are working with them in this level over the course of the semester, you will improve their writing. They will get better. And they want to get better. They do read the comments. They absolutely do read the comments. I can honestly say that. And let me just show you now so you get a sample. This is the final, this is another FY, first year se seminar. This is the final essay, and you can see how I really lighten up here. <laughs> and now they ought to be able to do it. And so this brings together a documentary film, a novel, and two journal academic articles by feminists on gender and, and violence and peace. And also, they watch an interview with Joshua Goldstein. But here again, this has much broader context to it. I have brought them by the end of the semester to a space where I can give them much more freedom, but yet still with some direction and guidance to it and with some criteria. So I think I will stop there. And we do, we do have a rubric that we've been using with our first year seminars. I'm good at clicking on it. There we go. 
This is a rubric we uh, use in our first year seminars for our assessment in, let me see if I can get, ah, I can't get it to go down, that's finished, ah, there we go, sorry. So you just see the categories here, five categories, um, and this is what we use uh, to evaluate our FYS um, 